Next on Big Talk from Small Libraries 2024, we are going to hear about um, leveraging student projects and organizations uh, from an, a trio of librarians from the uh, U.S. Military Academy Library in West Point, New York, my home state, actually. Um, <laughs> Uh, and uh, their FTE at the school is uh, 4,400. Is that still about accurate? Yeah. All right. Um, so uh, Jennifer, Lori, and Lisa, I will let you all introduce yourselves as um, um, and, uh, go ahead and tell us about how you're doing this at your library. Sure. So um, I'm going to start. My name is Jennifer Chess, and I am the communications and marketing librarian. Um, and then I think do you guys want to introduce yourselves now or once you get to your portion? Maybe we'll do it when we get to our portion. All right. Let me get cool. you started. Yeah. <laughs> so let me you. go ahead and start. So thank you so much for coming to our presentation today. We're excited to be able to talk to you about how we have leveraged students through student projects and student organizations at our academy in order to fulfill some of our initiatives and gain insight into one of our core audience spaces. Here is what you can expect us to discuss today. Uh, first, I'll talk about the different projects for which I've been a client, and I'll talk about our student advisory group before Lori will talk about her work as the programming librarian, and then Lisa will finish up talking about her work as the exhibit librarian. Because each of these initiatives are so different with different outcomes and different takeaways, we'll be including those within each of the initiatives as we talk about them. Next slide. Oh, let me share our why. Here are two of the 4,400 students that are enrolled at the United States Military Academy. We call our students cadets and we call our institution West Point and we'll be using those terms as we go along. West Point is one of five service academies in the United States. All of the cadets who attend West Point expect to spend at least the next four years after graduating in the military. At its most fundamental core, it is a four-year liberal arts school that focuses heavily on engineering in its many forms. In addition to having academic requirements, they also have military and athletic requirements that they are also graded on. Because of this, our cadets have a very highly regulated schedule and they don't have the same time for relaxation, recreation, or reflection that students at other schools would typically have. This also means that they're not allowed to work. We do not have student workers that would typically fulfill basic tasks, tackle projects, or provide that important insight into an academic library's student body. If we're not able to do it ourselves, it often means it goes undone. That sounds familiar, right? Looking into ways to leverage our student body was born in some ways out of necessity. Our resources are finite, and like so many of you, we often have to get creative in order to accomplish these tasks. However, I'll also note that one of the reasons why we continue to work with our cadets in these ways is because it is deeply satisfying to engage with these amazing humans that are still learning and developing into leaders of character. The enduring relationships that we've made with our cadets is something you cannot place value on. Next slide. So all cadets are required to complete some sort of capstone project or research within both their majors and their minors. This is everything from a mechanical engineering major who has to build some sort of contraption that would be able to transport an ill visitor from the top of the Statue of Liberty to a psychology major looking at how you can actually measure someone's character. Both of these, by the way, are actual projects that have been done. We have a major event towards the end of that's your Liberty one. <laughs> <laughs> they like had to like build this, this thing that they, and they actually did, they like made a, um, wow. they actually made the, uh, the structure <laughs> thing that they could then use pulleys for. Um, we have a major event towards the end of uh, each academic year called Projects Day, where the cadets are expected to present on these capstone projects. A number of years ago, our systems engineering librarian was talking to the systems engineering faculty who were looking for people to act as clients who had some sort of problem that the systems engineering students could find a solution for as part of their capstone projects. If you're not familiar with systems engineering, don't worry, I had no clue either until I started working with these cadets. It's essentially the process of finding optimal solutions to problems 
using multiple complex value-weighted options based on research. This process can be applied to virtually any problem. Initially, we did this as a favor to the department and as a way to build relationships with the faculty. We weren't really sure what we would get out of it, but we thought we would take advantage of this opportunity anyway, since the need was already built into the curriculum. One of the things that I have particularly appreciated from their work is that cadets approach these problems from a perspective that we don't have. We're not 18 to 22 year old students and seeing how they work through a problem is sometimes more valuable to me than their final proposed solutions. Next slide. I've continued to work with our systems engineering faculty as a client for five or six years now. I've also worked with our marketing department and I continue to look for other opportunities within other departments. So far, I've worked with over 15 groups on a variety of problems, including the ones listed here. As the communications and marketing librarian, I'm keenly interested in their perspective on my marketing efforts. Tell us the best ways to market to cadets. By using multiple groups and asking them the same questions over and over, I'm able to see if they come up with similar solutions. I can look at trends in their solutions and dig a little into the perspectives and attitudes of our students. One solution could be very biased if a group did insufficient research, but if we see the same solutions come up again and again, then we know that it's a valid solution that I should explore. This has also allowed me to see some major gaps in my marketing strategy. For example, I realized there wasn't a strong brand recognition of our catalog, which we call Scout, amongst all of the students. If we're not even on the same page with our students over something as basic as what terms we use to describe our catalog, then we need to be mindful of that when we interact with them. It became blatantly obvious that some of the students had no clue about many of our resources and services beyond the most obvious, such as circulation and reference. Research guides, what are those? Interlibrary loan, what's that? And our website was so siloed that they didn't know how to use it effectively. This led to them becoming easily frustrated and avoiding using our website. Also, I myself sometimes found it difficult to communicate my wants or even key performance indicators that we could use to further analyze the efficacy of the suge suggested solutions. If I couldn't provide clear key performance indicators, how were they supposed to give me realistic solutions? This has helped me better understand and define what value our patrons see in our library. I'm currently working with three different groups who are looking at our website. While it would be ideal to hire this work out to a contractor that specializes in user experience and website design, that's not really in the cards for us right now. Asking the cadets to do some of this work and come up with solutions based on their own perspectives will help us achieve our goal of building a more cadet-focused website. They're still in the planning phases of the project right now, but I look forward to their initial solutions that they'll actually be presenting to me next week. Next slide. Because I don't want this opportunity to feel like it's only applicable to academic libraries, I wanted to try and translate this particular idea into something that might work for other small libraries, regardless of what type of library you are. It does not have to just mean working with students, but looking more broadly on how you can find those pre-existing needs of others that you can use to fulfill your own needs. So make a wish list of the things you want to accomplish projects that you'd love to do, but you just don't have the time or the resources to actually complete. Maybe look into how you could partner with other people in your community who might be able to accomplish some of those projects for you. Look for a new social media manager who is looking to expand their portfolio. They might be willing to conduct a social media audit for you in exchange for agreeing to be added to their portfolio. You could look into new high school or college graduates who are looking for a job and are looking for ways to build out their resume. Maybe go look for an architect or an engineer who could analyze the foot traffic in your building and maybe pose some potential solutions that would either free up room or optimize traffic. You could talk to a marketer or a graphic design student who could conduct a sign audit for you and then design branded graphics for a series of signage for you. You can approach local boy or girl scouts, honor societies and other local organizations that are looking for volunteer opportunities to complete things like that DVD maintenance collection project that you've been putting off. And I encourage you to reach out to your local high schools or colleges to see if they do have any classes that require clients. In my experience, looking at disciplines that rely heavily on projects is where you wanna go. 
So maybe look at departments like business or engineering rather than a department like history or English where they would be much more likely to write a paper rather than to have to do some sort of project or come up with some sort of solution to a problem. Next slide. After many times working as a client, here are some of my biggest takeaways. The first is to realize that you can't expect a perfect solution. They are still students. They are still learning. And at the end of the day, they're doing this not because they're doing it as part of their profession, but because they are getting a grade for a class. And at the end of the day, the systems engineering faculty place far more importance on their students learning how to go through the process rather than coming up with an optimal solution that makes them satisfied. I just need to recognize that they're not going to give me exactly what I want and I need to be okay with that. But don't be afraid to point out when they're moving too far away from your goal. Even if you're not expecting a perfect solution, you still need to be willing to say, you know, this isn't working for me, let's regroup. Because you do ultimately wanna get something out of this. You don't want it to just be a favor that you're doing for somebody else and you're not getting any return on your investment of your time and effort. Next, look at the gems in their research. Every once in a while, they give me something that I just cannot stop thinking about. And those gems make all of the work worth it. One example I always think about is that a group highlighted the importance of social media influencers as part of a marketing strategy. That's not a novel marketing concept, but it highlighted the idea of using cadets as our social media influencers or brand ambassadors. And while I haven't really cracked the code on it yet, it still takes up space in my brain. Along with the gems, I always say to look at the gaps in their solutions as well. Again, they're students, they're learning, and they are often quite biased in their solutions. Sometimes I really find the gaps in those solutions to be where the value lies for me. For example, I've had marketing solutions where they talk almost exclusively about social media. Now, I know that cadets make up a very small portion of our social media followers, only about 5%. So while I don't think this is necessarily where we should focus on our marketing to cadets, if the cadets are looking at social media as a suggested optimal solution, then I need to find the gap in there between their belief that I should market to cadets on social media and the fact that our cadets don't want us in the same social media space as them. So maybe we don't communicate with them on social media, but maybe we take that same experience that they get and the same types of formats that they're used to seeing on social media and translate those into our other marketing channels and some of perhaps our digital learning objects. Then we can post them both on our research guides and canvas our um, academy's learning management system and then maybe put it on YouTube as shorts, maybe even on Instagram, although they don't live there with us. <laughs> Next slide. I'm only going to talk for a minute about our student advisory group because we literally just launched it several weeks ago. I was interested in establishing our student advisory group because of all the same reasons many other libraries invest in having advisory groups. But one reason why is because of that gem a cadet group shared with me about social media influencers. I think this group has the potential to create a vested group of brand ambassadors who deeply value the library and will be willing to share their views with their peers. As I said, our initial meeting was just a couple of weeks ago and we had some really wonderful outcomes from it. First of all, although the group was small, it was very diverse, 50% male, 50% female. It included both freshmen and a senior. I really appreciated that they offered their opinions and were willing to disagree with each other. Now, the fact is our student body is organized in a similar way as the military. There is a very well-defined hierarchy and we were a little concerned that perhaps the underclassmen would not be willing to share their opinions if they differed from the other classmen who were in the group. But that fortunately wasn't the case. We were able to ask further questions and really dig deeper into their ideas. This helped us to see where their priorities were, which were not necessarily where we expected and what value they view the library to hold. Having those rich conversations, being able to hear the different perspectives, how they varied and when they agreed, was just so incredibly valuable. If you've not already established at least one community advisory group, I challenge you to start one today. And with that, I'll turn it over to Lori.
Oh, Jen, you are a tough act to follow. Thank you so much. I know. Oh, <laughs> man. My name is uh, Lori Maluli, and I am the events and programming librarian uh, here at West Point. And I'm going to pivot now and just talk about programming here. Um, Next slide, Lisa, please. As Jen explained, we are a service academy library, and this makes our patrons a rare cohort. Uh, they're athletes, they're scholars, and future officers with many training commitments. Uh, so providing programming here at the library for them can be tricky, as their schedules are heavily prescribed. Uh, and this makes it very difficult, but not impossible, to plan major programming events. So therefore, the majority of programming that we offer here is passive programs or pop-ups. And just a word about passive programming. I encourage every librarian on this call to consider offering more passive programs. Uh, passive programming results in active learning that is self-paced and self-directed. This eliminates time and scheduling barriers for both library staff, us, right, and our patrons. And it creates opportunities for patrons to interact with library staff and resources as their schedule allows. Uh, some examples of our passive programs include blackout poetry, which we leave out during the entire month of April. We do make and takes, uh, Diwali lanterns, um, and then we actually just leave out a puzzle uh, all the time. Um, and it's great when cadets have 10 minutes or even faculty, they'll come and work on that puzzle as they come and go. We also offer pop-up programs such as the therapy dogs. You can see Joseph with Seamus there on the slide. Uh, Pop-ups are great for us because we can offer them as our schedule allows, staff schedule. And the cadets are delighted when they happen upon something here at the library that they're not expecting. But having said that, we do offer a few special scheduled events, um, and these need to be planned out at least a semester in advance and sometimes a year out. And again, this is because our cadets are ho uh, so heavily scheduled and finding space in the library to host major events can be challenging as well. We're very blessed and fortunate here in this building because on the sixth floor, we have the Hague Room. Um, this is a gorgeous venue space that's used primarily for diplomatic events and major conferences. Uh, however, if we plan far enough in advance, uh, we can reserve it for library programming events. But regardless of the type of programming, uh, we do try to address four things before offering anything here at the useful library. Next slide. This is paramount. Our goal is to always align with our mission statement, and we are intentional with our programming about supporting the curriculum and creating future scholars. Uh, I had just mentioned make and takes, and we do offer them, uh, but we don't just offer crafts for crafting sake. Uh, for example, we have a holiday card make and take every December, and it is very popular with the cadets. They love to write home just before the holidays, but in addition to putting out Craft supplies, we also put out examples of cadet letters from our special collections and archives. Uh, this way, our cadets can read what cadets from 100 years ago wrote about over the holidays. Um, and this gives our cadets a sense of history of the academy and the tradition of the Long Gray Line, which they're a part of. But most importantly, we recognize the uniqueness of the space here at the library, and we strive to make it a place for the cadets to become engaged with knowledge, ideas, um, and one another. Next slide. We also feel it is important to learn about and lean into the interests and talents of our students. Uh, I am a librarian in her 50s, and right now my favorite thing is watching The Great British Bake Off on Netflix. Uh, that is not what our students are interested in right now. So the onus is on me to find out what they're interested in. The onus is on you as librarians to find out what the interests of your communities are. Uh, fortunately, there are over 160 official clubs here at West Point. These range from athletic clubs, religious clubs, diversity clubs, many clubs. And so this provides an endless line of inquiry for us when thinking about programming. Um, everyone on this call has heard of patron-driven acquisitions. Uh, this could be called patron-driven programming. And so if they want it, the library will make it happen. Um, also, when a cadet wants to take the lead on a program here at the library, we let them, we let them. The talent and drive of our Corps of Cadets is truly astounding and has made every program so far a tremendous success. Next slide. Okay, so my favorite slide. <laughs> every program we have is an opportunity to point our patrons back to our resources. You'll see her on the left, Lisa Gomez, who you're gonna hear from next. She routinely will create um, an exhibit for our events and she'll include items from our collections. 
Uh, for example, for our open mic that we had in the Hague Room, Lisa pulled war poetry from our special collections and archives for display. Also, we also include uh, book displays, as you see in the, in the middle, um, or we'll even create a custom lib guide that gives our patrons the opportunity to discover items in our collections that they just may not be aware of. And importantly, we're not just pointing back to our physical collection, we are making our patrons aware of our services as well. Our librarians prioritize attending our programs, and this gives them an opportunity to meet with our cadets in a setting that's not the classroom and it's not the reference desk, right? So we're planting those seeds and creating um, those connections face to face. Next slide. Finally, we treat every library program as an opportunity to make further connections. Um, as the programming librarian, I am very intentional about interacting with both cadets and faculty when they attend one of my events. And I'm straightforward about letting them know that I'm open to collaborating with them on further projects. Uh, this is old school networking and I can tell you it really works. Next slide, Lise. Um, it's almost like a ripple effect. You can think of it as one interaction leading to concentric circles that get wider and wider. And this is just one case in point, and this is our tiny art show. Uh, two years ago, our library offered our first tiny art show, and I know most of you that are listening in library land are familiar with these tiny art shows. Um, it was extremely successful, and the canvases that the cadets painted were very well done. You can see the four in this slide. This is just four examples. Um, Lisa turned this into a major exhibit on the second floor of the library. It was extremely popular. It was so popular that she uh, digitized those canvases and created an online exhibit, and you can see that on our website if you'd like to. Um, but this one program and this one exhibit has led to numerous collaborations. Next slide. And you can just see here how, uh, if you follow on the left, um, members of the English department, which oversees the Center for Humanities, visited the exhibit, the tiny art exhibit. And based on those conversations during the visit, the English department asked if they could borrow our tiny canvases for their annual Night of the Arts, which is one of their major events. And we happily agreed. So our tiny canvases are like little ambassadors that go out across West Point for other events. Um, we went to their event and I shared that I've always wanted to have an open mic here at the library, something spoken word where the cadets can write their own poetry. Um, the English faculty said they would love to work on that with us. And in fact, uh, a member of the English department agreed to serve as our MC for our first open mic. Um, the jazz club came to that first open mic and they were so excited about it um, that they came to me and asked if they could create an event here at the library that would cover the history of jazz. Um, next event. The next slide. <laughs> so we are actually uh, in the planning stages of this new event. Uh, this program is entirely cadet led. You can see Josias there um, with Kenneth. Uh, those are two cadets that are in charge of this. Um, the jazz group is collaborating with the history department and the West Point Music Research Center. So you can see those circles getting bigger and bigger, right? And because the cadets will be looking at the history of jazz through the lens of civil rights, this is an opportunity for students to investigate and challenge existing narratives about race and history. As I mentioned before, we expect our cadets to be part of the scholarly conversation. And as you can see, this upcoming event, uh, this upcoming library program it will truly be a work of scholarship. Um, and this is just one example. Next slide. So some takeaways just to summarize from the programming perspective. Uh, some tips you can use. Um, recognize that each program is an opportunity to widen your network. Remember, members of departments talk to each other. Students and patrons talk to each other, right? No matter how big or how small your community is, it really is a small world after all, okay? And if you have a reputation for being collaborative and supportive, patrons with programming ideas will literally come to you, okay? Also, find out what the interests of your patrons are and let them come up with their own programming ideas, your students as well. This triggers an intrinsic motivation as well as a sense of agency. Let them drive, but be sure to offer guidance when needed. Everyone on this call knows what it takes to host a successful library programming event. We've all been there, right? Um, and as I mentioned, we're working with those two cadets right now on the jazz event. Um, and Lisa and Jen can back me up. They, ha they have major ideas, but they almost have too many ideas and they really haven't ever planned a program like this. So we still need to work with them um, on implementation and we wanna give them the support they need so that their program is a success, okay? 
And then finally, lean into the existing groups that are on your campus or in your community, and also lean into their workflows. I mentioned that we have over, well, we have 160 official clubs here at West Point. Every club here has a cadet in charge, all right? And these cadets are already in a position of leadership. So whenever I have an update, I push out that inf information through the CIC, through the cadet in charge. And this is efficient and effective for me, right? So lean into existing workflows and communication protocols. The last thing you want to do is herd cats every time you have a program. So with that, I will now turn it over to my colleague, Lisa Gomez. Thank you so much. <laughs> um, so good afternoon, everyone. So I'm Lisa Gomez and I'm the exhibition librarian here at Youth in the Library. It's a pleasure to be with you today. Thank you so much for joining our session. Um, so we work hard to incorporate many different types of displays and exhibits throughout the year, from formal exhibitions where we work with rare materials from our archives and special collections that take quite a bit of long-term planning to pop-up displays that will support classroom instruction, conferences, and special events happening across campus. Um, each project is an opportunity for us to assess how our patrons, our cadets, have engaged with the exhibit. Um, so it, it's important to think about for an exhibit that's lasted several months and also a display that maybe was only up for about an hour, thinking about um, how our cadets are engaging with it and how we might be able to do better. Um, so what drives student engagement with our exhibits? So research on the topic has shown that students are really looking for some sensory motor experiences. They're interested in immersive exhibits. They also tend to have a higher level engagement when the presentation of abstract topics are done in a really tangible way. Uh, it's also incredibly effective when the presentation or the exhibit uh, is going to have several different anchor points that are going to be highlighted throughout the library. So there's gonna, we have our designated uh, exhibit space, but then Lori and Jen often assist me and several other of our amazing staff with creating signage and different book displays throughout our space to reinforce the exhibit's theme. Um, so upon our own evaluations and review, what our cadets love to learn about is themselves and each other. Um, so what better way for them to do this, uh, for us to help them do this, than to have the cadets drive these exhibits and create them themselves. So the photographs here on this slide, uh, this was a fun exhibit that we created around Halloween uh, this past fall. of One of our most famous ex-cadets, Mr. Edgar Allan Poe, it was really atmospheric uh, and was incredibly popular with cadets in humanities majors. Lots of uh, English majors or classes, they stopped over. Um, but also cadets in general, everybody really just loved to hear about Poe's antics, why he was court-martialed and why he ended up having to leave West Point. So these displays are some really great opportunities to help connect cadets to their past, which is now going to be their legacy. So as with the librarian profession as a whole, I'm sure everyone out here has been thinking themselves, talking with colleagues, intent, uh, attending professional uh, engagements on um, diversity, equity, and inclusion. And we are super committed to providing a welcoming and enriching environment for all students, faculty, and staff. And we really have been talking about and we want to do so in manners that are deep and effective and meaningful. And one manner to which that we're finding um, we we've been able to do so is being a place and a space for our students and cadets to research West Point, the Army, and also their world histories. And as Lori discussed, to be truly active in creating, understanding, and promoting their own stories and narratives. You know, as, en as enlisted soldiers, which they all are, and soon to be officers, our cadets are under different regulations and many traditional college students. So as with federal employees, like we all are, we have to stay completely nonpartisan. So our students, maybe they, so they actually, they cannot engage in activism as we might traditionally think about college campuses with different protests and things like that. Uh, however, there is another extremely important and effective manner to participate in the social justice conversations that we know are incredibly important to this generation of students and cadets. And that way is through um, academ academia and scholarship. So that's something that we can help with. Um, so we were incredibly lucky this uh, last fall, um, fall of 2022, to a, and then an exhibit in February and March of 2023, to be part of a major exhibition collaboration between 
from the West Point Department of History, us, the UCMA Library, and also the West Point Museum to create an exhibition titled Foundations, Black Experiences of West Point. So the Black History Project at West Point is part of the History Department, and it has cadets and faculty working together to study West Point's history and to conduct new historical research regarding the experiences of Black persons at West Point. And part of the cadets' hope was to create an exhibit to display their findings. So four cadets, along with their faculty advisors, spent hours in the library's archives and special collections conducting the research with primary and secondary sources, looking at memoirs, looking through administrative records. Um, and then they spent hours with myself and our team writing exhibit label copy, vetting oral histories, looking at marketing designs, um, and also completely um, driving the exhibition design itself and, and interpretation and selecting which material to include. Um, it's really one of the most uh, rewarding projects I've ever been a part of in my career. And the responses that we, we received from the cadets and alumni that felt inspired and seen, I'll just, I'll never forget them. Um, so what it also did, this project, is it allowed cadets to further engage with their research as true scholars, as they're seen here presenting here with the digital version of our foundations exhibit on Project Day that Jen talked about. So this experience, it allowed them to understand that a historian's work is not done once the book is written, once the paper's written, or the project is complete. You wanna go, you, it's important for them to learn that the, um, you have to engage with the experts in your field uh, and really the wider community to ensure that your work continues to be discussed in the broader conversation. Um, so what I really took away from this experience was how transformative a project is when cadets create these, when they create the work and they are fully engaged in the research and they write the stories and, and also how powerful buy-in from an academic department or partnering organizations where you live um, can be. So super, super important to, to join other groups like Lori discussed with all of the different cadet groups on campus, so many different opportunities for that. Um, so that I was incredibly lucky that the person in my position prior um, to me, she was had a very strong relationship with the history department. So they felt comfortable reaching out uh, for that, that really big exhibit. Um, but I've been thinking about ways so that so that was lucky and that was really great that they came to me. So now my job is thinking about every opportunity, um, any person that any cadet, any patron, any library staff that comes into our library, thinking about how to leverage their expertise. Every every cadet here is brilliant and has amazing um, amazing insights to offer. So here on, on this slide, so this is an incredibly gifted. He was a senior back in the spring of 2023 and his expertise were in Chinese history. And it just so happened that I was doing rounds one evening when I was closing the library and he was at the first floor circulation desk talking to one of our wonderful techs. And I heard him say that he was having a great night. He had just turned in his thesis um, on the history of China right around the turn of the century. Um, and so my ears perked up because we were looking into doing an exhibit on the China Relief Expedition and West Point's role in it. Uh, so I ran down and I asked um, if he would have any interest in taking a look at some of the items that I'd selected from our Archives and Special Collections Department or if he'd want to uh, engage further. And he said, absolutely. The next day he came to Archives and Special Collections and then he just drove it home. He did an incredible job bringing in narratives and threads and really, really important um, cultural understanding and knowledge that made us um, really think about what we wanted to say and how we wanted our cadets to uh, feel, to understand their role as, as West Point officers and then also connected to the greater army and then in the world itself. Um, so we're super, that, 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 that I was incredibly happy. And then I thought about, you know, every single person that comes through the door, um, if you if you just find the right um, connection for them and then everyone has a really, really important expertise that could be interesting on so many different levels. So some exhibits in the work. So as Lori and Jen spoke about, that ripple effect is so real. Um, so because of the the success of the foundations and the China Relief Expedition exhibit, I've had faculty from the history department reach out 
this semester and they are interested in, and actually they're already hard at work uh, with creating an exhibit on the Columbian Exchange. So this particular professor, she's actually having her cadets create the exhibit during class time. And she had asked me to come in and I've been going in and giving uh, formal instruction on creating exhibit copy um, and different ways to effectively write a label, which I'm sure a lot of you have experienced this yourself. You know, you tell cadets, all well, these labels are gonna be, uh, you know, 100 words max. And they get really excited because they're used to doing 2,500 uh, word papers and it's all, there's a lot and they, they think, oh, this will be, I have no time, so this will be great. But as we talk about in class, it's some of the hardest writing you'll ever do to really effective, effectively convey a message um, in such a short amount of time. But it's something that the instructor will say to them. The, it's, it's incredibly important as officers to be able to deliver a message to a wide group of people with, re, with really important concise messaging. You never know what type of a situation you could be in where you have to quickly and effectively communicate. Um, so that's been really, really um, wonderful to be involved with that. Um, so it, and something else that I've been really lucky to experience and want to continue to leverage is our connected community. Um, and creating lifelong relationships. So our alumni, they're incredibly influential and brilliant individuals, many who love West Point, even if and when their experience was difficult or complicated. So I have, uh, I was very lucky, a class of 2020 West Point grad contacted me a few months ago and asked if she could be involved in um, the Black History Month project for this year. I said, absolutely. She was so generous with her time and her expertise and her um, and her creativity. Um, and so I, I realized how fantastic understanding the power of alumni because she has a, a big network of fellow cadets who graduated with her and she's in touch with many current cadets. So I'm able to tap into um, their world a little bit and be able to, you know, I have this trusted person who can say, you know, she, they're, the library is great to work with. Um, so cultivating those relationships is something that it's invaluable to the job and something I, I wouldn't be able to do my job without it. Um, so some takeaways. So even when exhibition projects are student led, they still take an incredible amount of time. Lori, Jen, all of my coworkers, they, Every exhibition is an entire library project. We have everyone helping from cataloging to editing to helping with the digital display to marketing to signage. Um, and even still, it always ends up taking, I hate to admit it, but like double what I originally planned. Um, so definitely, definitely give yourself and your team tons of time to do these because especially when you're working with themes that are, that are so important and involved, uh, you might find that you're gonna go in a different direction than you originally thought you were gonna go in. So give yourself time and grace to do that. That way your final product can be something that you just, that, that's super um, reflective of the hard work and the people that you're talking about. And two, so something that I, um, I think about a lot and talk a lot with my colleagues is, um, understanding, so because, you know, exhibits and Lori's programming and marketing and uh, pretty much everything that we do as librarians now is so visual, it's online, everyone can look at it, there's going to be a lot in constant feedback, especially with our exhibit space, it's right on the second floor, everybody walks by there, so you are going to get constant feedback, so most of it is so amazing and so supportive, um, some not, you know, sometimes it's, 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 it's important to, to keep talking to yourself, you know, you're gonna get feedback all day, every day. Some of it's gonna be critical and all of it is important, um, but mainly focusing on sort of that bigger picture that if these are cadet led exhibits and projects, we can really rest on the fact that we are serving our mission and our patrons. Um, so it's, it's comforting <laughs> when you're wondering if, if you did everything right. <laughs> um, and then lastly, definitely don't underestimate your community members and how proud they are of where they live and communities that they've been involved with. Um, they're super invested in creating honest historic legacies. So they I had worked in a public library prior to here and we had done um, started working on oral history projects for the community and it was unbelievable the outpouring of um, 
patrons and constituents that wanted to be involved. Um, and so, so here for me, my, my big takeaway is always working with the current cadets because they'll eventually be alumni and they'll come, they'll want to continue to work on projects with us or, or lend their connections to us as well. Um, so thank you so much. Here are the, here are our contact um, email. Uh, it, please don't hesitate to reach out if you have any questions, comments, or if you just want to talk about exhibits. I love talking about them. Um, so please don't ever hesitate to reach out. Sure. Great, thank you. Um, all right, thank you so much, uh, Jennifer, Lori, and Lisa. Uh, all right, um, if you want to, um, yeah, we can take questions now. If you want to pop back to uh, your contact info there so people can yes. do that if they need to grab it. Um, yes. If anyone has any questions um, you want to ask, we have, we have plenty of time here. Um, type into the questions section of your GoToWebinar interface, and I am monitoring that, and I will um, pull those questions for our presenters. Um, we do have a few are, that have already come through, so get your questions um, in while we're here. Uh, so our first question we have is, so this is great for sure, sorry. Um, this is a great session. Um, you. Yeah, lots of work I know that you all have put into these exhibits and, and working with, I know I worked in a university library for nine years and working with these students and faculty is, is um, it takes a lot, yes, of time and effort and energy um, and uh, more power to you all for doing this. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> definitely going to check out some of those uh, sessions yet. I love those, the one that I love, I love those tiny paintings. I've seen other places do that. Oh, yeah. They're just so They're amazing. So good. <laughs> yeah, so I'm going to definitely check out the ones that you've done. I want to do one of those someday. I'll have to see where someone's doing that. <laughs> um, so let's see some questions we have here. Um, do you think, uh, so first question is, do you think these tactics would be transferable to working with girl or boy scouts? and 4-H clubs or other type of school clubs? Yes, definitely. And, yeah. you know, I'll, I'll refer back and say that I think maybe have some projects already sort of, or ideas of things that you want them to do, right? Because so oftentimes they'll come and be like, hey, I want to volunteer, what can I do? So having some uh, some projects already sort of um, that they can do. And, you know, obviously a, you know, my daughters are, are nine and they're in Girl Scouts. Their capabilities are very different than an 18 to 22 year old or an adult or a senior citizen might have. And so maybe looking at the different projects and seeing where, you know, the sorts of things, you know, doing some collected collection maintenance or things like that are maybe not things that a nine year old would be able to do but, um, you know, kind of thinking through your projects so that you can be honest with these organizations and say, yes, we can do something with you or, you know, maybe not right now or something like that. Absolutely. Yeah, tell it to them. And I know when they get into 4-H, they do get, um, the kids get older and older and they're still in 4-H. So definitely you could be working on things that as they advance. <clears throat> Can I add to that too, uh, just because, you know, I was a Girl Scout leader for 11 years. Um, it, it fulfills their requirements, it was crazy. It, it, um, I just had two daughters. Anyway, it fulfills their requirements as well, right? They have leadership hours that they have to do um, for H, I would imagine as well. So, you know, it's, it's a win-win for them. They can do book displays. They can come up with their own programs and have them hosted at the library for the greater community too. So um, it's, again, it, it's patron driven. If, if they need that, that's something that the library can help. Uh, and that's that's when those guardrails come in, come into play, just kind of guiding them through. Yeah. And maybe that could be your teen advisory group, right? Or you could look at them as, I call them brand ambassadors, right? And so as people that could go out into the community in other ways and help promote you and your library. Absolutely. Promotion and advocacy, all libraries of all types need that outside of their little bubble, definitely. Oh, absolutely. I'm thinking back, I wish that um, I had, I knew what I know now if, when I was working in a public library, because I think that would have been so fun working with a troop on a display, especially um, at the archives and special collection materials are amazing, but you have 
so many uh, limitations with how you can mount them to preserve their integrity. When you're working with uh, different kinds of papers and, and not rare materials, you can be so creative and the, and the kids really are. So I, that would be, I'd love to see what the troop would come up with in, in all the different public library spaces. That'd be awesome. Absolutely, yeah. Um, if anyone's done anything like that, share with us. Uh, yeah, please. please. <laughs> hear how it's gone at your libraries. <laughs> You know, I, I don't know if this is, I sort of think that this is like a normal thing, but um, our troops in our community, they are getting ready to do International Day. So that mm -hmm. could be something that the library could collaborate. Totally. And, you know, everybody has to make signs and talk about the different parts. Well, maybe you could um, plan to have that become an exhibit after the fact and take some of those materials but again, you do definitely want those guardrails and be like, okay, these are the types of things that we want from you if you're going to then put them into an exhibit and maybe pull some books and have a book display to go along with the different materials and that kind of thing. Absolutely. All right, uh, next question we have, one, and I, I don't know if you mentioned this or not, um, it's from earlier in the session. Um, how did you recruit students for the advisory group? Mm. Good question. So, yeah. <laughs> so I put a sign up and I put up a sign for a year and uh -huh. literally the minute, like five minutes before I was going to send out the email to people, um, I got one person who was like, hey, I saw your sign. The signs <laughs> didn't work. No. Oh. What we actually did is Lori was so gracious to allow me to put in a question in our registration forms for our different programs and mm -hmm. say, would you be interested in this? And that actually got a lot of people. Um, so I don't know how many people we had registered total um, for different, several hundred, three, 400. And out of that, I got 89 people who said yes, that they would be interested in joining. And so I sent out the email to 89 people. Um, we did only end up getting, um, we had about 10 people say that they would like to come to an event, but that ultimately we only got four people but um still like i said it was really diverse and so even though it was only four those conversations were just amazing but it really did sort of have to come from these registrations and maybe other places and so i've actually found in general that adding on um a question to the registration is also sort of how i you know collect my data for marketing and how did you hear about it? And do you want to join the newsletter? And um, Lori's been really, really kind and patient with allowing me to add that kind of stuff to the registration for our programs. Yeah, like survey type things like that when you're trying to find from get ask any of your patrons um, you know, what they want or what they're interested in. You have to figure out where where they are and and, and where they're going to respond. Be more likely to uh, click a thing, answer something. Right. Yeah. You know, as a marketer, I would also say that that evolves over time, right? So we have a bunch of marketing channels that we have seen as effective, but that has actually changed over the years. Mm -hmm. And um, it's interesting to see how that changes, even in sort of like the little bubble sphere of West Point being sort of this like weird little microcosm that um, even how they get information and how they want to get information has evolved over time. Oh, sure. Yeah. Um, let's see here. What do I got? Uh, so here's some <clears throat> someone who, is, who just typed in that they've done this kind of thing. Um, so here's some ideas for people. Um, I partnered with my local national state park and a Girl Scout troop. We created a pollinator garden in the park and created several different learning bags with themes yeah, <laughs> that families could check out when visiting the park. Themes like the life cycles of amphibians and insects, the water cycle, etc. We also had uh, book lists for th further reading. Okay. Getting outside and partnering with awesome. a park. Awesome. Oh, I just love how all the resources for the library are, were baked into that. That's that's exceptional. I love that. Absolutely. And then we have a comment here about um, the passive programming. You talked about that way back in the beginning, too, and I agree with this definitely. And this is something that I think another thing that we mentioned in a previous session about having to promote the in in the things that aren't 
they don't bring the bodies into the library, but they're just as important. Um, and they're not something maybe you're interacting with these people, but it's still something to keep track of. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> Excuse me. This person says we need more recognition from our reporting agencies of the importance of passive mm. and drop in anytime and pop up programs. Word. Mm -hmm. People won't commit, don't show up, but mm -hmm. when there are things for them to do whenever they visit, then they come back. So yeah, don't you know? Don't be discouraged by the. Cause this happens to all of us. I scheduled a thing. I went through all this work, and nobody came at the thing at you know, two p.m. Just put some things out and see what disappears of the passive programming or crafts or whatever. And see, so some of that is also where joining, you know, aligning with different groups, you know, is very helpful. Um, mm -hmm. You know, because then you can maybe reach out to them, like Lori mentioned about going through, you know, perhaps their um, their their communication workflows, right? And we we've had that in the past where maybe some of our events weren't well attended or whatever, and then the word gets out to the right person who has that interest, and all of a sudden they're all gone. And, and to try it again too, just because the event didn't work the first time, maybe. The word had to spread and then you say, you know, let's do another one and see if it, you know, finally people show up and then, oh, yes, yes. we talk to each other and now we're here. <laughs> yes. It's hard to get those things going, definitely. Yeah. All right. Um, so that was the last question and comment we had. Does anybody have any other desperate questions or comments you want to share right now with uh, uh, for uh, Jennifer, Laura, and Lisa about their um yeah, about their presentation and their uh, programming and exhibits that they've been doing. The exhibits are, I think, are the, are the coolest thing. I know, you know, libraries are always putting out exhibits ourselves, but I think getting your, whoever your patrons are, and in your case, the students involved is is so cool. Gets them more um, invested in the library. And, yes. You know, as, as a thing that's theirs too, you know. Absolutely. And just, it's, they're, yeah. they're so brilliant. <laughs> it's <laughs> happening I'm not. It also frees up some of the time. <laughs> For me <laughs> to do all the things. <laughs> right. You don't have to come up with the ideas that come to you with them. Absolutely. Exactly. <laughs> all right. Perfect. All right. So I don't see anything else come in. That's great. But there is their contact information for uh, Jennifer, Lori, and Lisa. So if any of you do want to reach out to them about anything um, and to um, do, do so. All right. So thank you so much.